to Hollywood Community Church. We are so glad that you and your family are watching us online and we are excited to see what God does in your family's life. And we are praying for you. We care about each and every single one of you and we love you guys. Now, if this is your first time tuning in and watching us online, we want to say welcome to you and we're glad that you found us at rhcc.org or Facebook or YouTube or on our special website channel to watch the live stream. We are glad that you're here and we'd love to know that you were watching with us. So you might say, Brad, how do I let you guys know that I'm watching with you? Well, you can let us know in the comments if you're watching on Facebook, YouTube, or our online church platform. And you can also go to our website, ourhcc.org, and fill out our Connect card that is on our website. Give us your name, some information about you, and we would love nothing more than to reach out to you and to your family and welcome you to our church family, but also see how we can pray for you and minister in your lives. So go ahead and do that right now. As we come to our offering moment, we want to encourage you guys to continue to be faithful in your tithes and offerings. We serve a great, faithful God who has promised us things and has promised to provide for us and look out for us and take care of us. And so we can rest assured that as we go through this difficult season of COVID and all the things that the stresses that life brings our way, that we have a faithful God who will continue to work. And he's asked us to, of all the blessings and all the things he's given, to give a little bit of that back to show our trust and our faith in him. And so you might sit back and say, Brad, how can I remain faithful in my tithes and offerings? What are some different ways that I can give? So um, that's a great question. We're glad you asked it. So here's several different ways. You can mail it into us at our church address. You can also use our website, ourhcc.org. You can also use our text to give option where you just send a text to this number, the amount you'd like to give. And lastly, you can use our giving option in our church app. You can find it on the App Store and Google Play. Just search for Hollywood Community Church. And within that app, you'll be able to use the giving option there. So would you join with me in a word of prayer? Father God in heaven, we thank you for your love and your grace. Father, we thank you that you are a God who promises to provide for all of our needs, Father God. And so we look today, Father, and today we are asking that you would provide our daily bread for each of us, Father God. Give us what we need today, Father, and we trust that tomorrow when we wake up, we'll ask you for the same and you will meet our needs, whatever they are, Father God. And so we trust you with our whole heart, our whole lives. And Father, we pray that as we go into worship, Father God, that you would be honored, that you would be glorified, and we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We have a very special couple, uh, Matt and Betty Sinelli. They have been longtime members of Hollywood Community Church, and they have been a blessing to Kelly and I personally, but also have been a blessing to so many people within our church. They have such loving hearts, giving hearts. They are servants, and we love this family, and God is calling them to an exciting new adventure. So go ahead and check their story out. 
Hi church family, uh, we're the Sinellis, uh and we wanted to uh, come join you uh, at your home uh, via live stream uh, to share a testimony with you guys uh, of, of our church uh, testimony here at Hollywood Community Church. Um, most people remember their first day at Hollywood Community Church, and um, I actually don't. Um, I was actually, uh, when I was born, my mom and my dad came here, they remember us here. Uh, back in 1984 was my first Sunday here, um, and uh, I was able to, uh, had the privilege of growing up uh, here at the church uh, through some great uh, Bible teachers throughout the years. Uh, and so my faith was made strong not only in this church, but at, Ho at a Hollywood Christian School uh, for 12 years. Um, and then uh, after a period of time, um, I decided to come back to Hollywood. Um, just gone away just for a little bit. And during this time is when I met Betty and we uh, got married and we were looking for uh, a home church to plant our roots in. And we visited um, Hollywood Community Church. Of course, Matt knew everybody. I didn't know a soul, but we, I walked in the doors of Hollywood Community Church 12 years ago and I felt at home. And it wasn't long after that that we had this really enthusiastic, energetic guy come up to us and say, I want to start a life group with you young couples. And that man was Mike Rittering. Him and Amy invited us into their home and showed us what it looks like to have a life group to grow as a church family. Since then, we've been able to host many small groups in our home, um, particularly for married couples. And um, we've enjoyed Pastor Brad and Kelly's life group and have really come to um, know them as family. We're not just church members getting together um, every Sunday night on Zoom. We're, it's a family, and uh, it's been lovely. Yeah. And so now it comes the hard part um, of this video, and um, this is the part where we share with you that uh, God has called Betty and I and, uh, and, and the girls uh, to Tallahassee. Um, and so um, this is uh, going to be our last Sunday uh, with you guys uh, as members here at Hollywood Community Church. And um, we're really sad to leave our home church. I mean, this is the church that we planted roots in uh, for these years, these many years. And so we're going to miss you guys uh, very much. Um, and so the direction moving forward is I've actually sold my business. Um, and, uh, and then we're going to be entering into full-time ministry uh, in Tallahassee where God has called us. And so we just wanted to share that with you. And, and uh, with the complication of COVID, um, we would much rather share this with you face-to-face -face and, um, and, and come together. But um, we felt that this would probably be the best way to do that. And we just want to share with you guys that we love you. And uh, Catalina, would you like to uh, share anything? Yes. I love this church. I wish we didn't have to leave, but we feel great about making this video. And is there anything you want to say, Billy? Hi. I miss you. Bye. We just want to thank you, Hollywood. Thank you to Pastor Ryan and Miss Vicki. It's very rare that you walk into a church and you meet a pastor that knows everyone by name and even your kids' names. So thank you so much, Hollywood Community Church. We love you. We're going to miss you. Yeah, we're going to miss you guys so much. And, you know, a church uh, is very important for um, just the growth of a Christian. Um, you know, it's impossible to be a Christian and to do it alone at home. Um, and so uh, Hollywood Community Church presents an atmosphere for us that we're able to grow together, rub shoulders together, and do life together. Um, our life group has been there through the blood, sweat, and tears of the growth of our family, um, through great times, times of praise, and times of strife and so um, we just want to encourage you guys if you guys uh, are not part of a life group or not connected somehow I know it's kind of tough with COVID but uh, through Zoom or through uh, meet other means uh, we encourage you guys uh, to find that and so we thank you once again and we just want to say a temporary goodbye because we know nothing is a permanent goodbye uh, but uh, and we'll be visiting in the near future okay, okay. love you guys bye-bye bye, -bye. bye. bye. Matt, Betty, Catalina, and Liliana, we want you to know how much we appreciate you. You guys have been such a blessing to us, to me personally, and to our Hollywood Community Church family, and we are going to miss you. And I want you to know we want God's richest blessings on your life. So let's have a word of prayer for the Sinellis as God leads them away. Father, thank you so much for this wonderful family. Thank you for the blessing that they've been to me personally, and the blessing that they've been to Hollywood Community Church. Lord, they've served 
served in so many ways. And so Father, now we pray for your richest blessings upon their life as they move to Northern Florida. God, I pray you'd help them to find a church, to get plugged into a church and to serve you there, Lord, with all of their heart and soul and mind. And Lord, we pray that you would raise up others to take their place. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, church. Our reading today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God bless you all today.
Good morning, Hollywood Community Church family. Welcome to the Burkholder home. This is week number two of us filming the service in all of our homes. And so you're, you're home worshiping and we're here worshiping today. And I'm so glad you've chosen to worship with us. Let me thank you for your support and prayers. I've received so many messages from many of our people who, uh, who just wanted us to know that they were praying for us, specifically for Pastor Jose and Pastor Brad. And I want you to know we appreciate your prayers. Both of them are doing very well, and the rest of our te staff have tested negative. So thank you so much for your support and for your prayers. Let's begin the message with a word of prayer today. Father, thank you so much for your protective hand on uh, our families, on our ministry. Thank you that Pastor Jose is doing better. Thank you that Pastor Brad is doing better, that you've protected the rest of our staff. And Lord, the way that you continue to protect our church family, we thank you so much for that. We thank you for Jesus today and what he has done for us and what he continues to do for us. And we pray that the Holy Spirit of God would help us today to not only understand this passage, but even more importantly, to apply it to our lives and rejoice in the truth that we have in Jesus. And so we thank you for what you're going to do this morning. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Well, we've all experienced it. You're watching television late at night. You begin to doze off. When all of a sudden this booming voice comes on the television, wakes you out of your sleep and introduces you to a gadget that supposedly is supposed to revolutionize your life. You know the products I'm talking about, the Snuggie, you know, the wearable blankets. How many of you actually bought one of those? Or the Ped Egg that helps you to have smooth and help healthy looking feet or the pillow pets for children. It's not a pillow, no, it's a pet, it's a pillow pet. And then uh, the ever famous Ginsu knives. It seems like almost all of those infomercials ended with the ever popular tagline, but wait, there is so much more. Paul has been laying out the truth of our justification and the benefits of our justification. And quite frankly, I would say today that what God has done for us through Jesus Christ is nothing short of amazing. You'll remember, we mentioned a few weeks ago that we have peace with God. We have 24-7 access into the grace of God. We have the hope of future glory. And as Brad shared last week, we we have purpose in our sufferings. God uses our sufferings to accomplish a purpose. And as wonderful as those things, I would say, but wait, there is so much more. In addition to those amazing benefits, God's love for us en encompasses the totality of our salvation from beginning to end. And we see that in the passage that we're looking at. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Romans chapter 5. I'd encourage you to grab your Bible, your iPad, your iPhone, and, and, and follow along. I'd, I'd love to have you see these truths in Scripture. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 6, Paul says this, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is Paul's most complete and exhaustive explanation of the gospel in the book of Romans. Some have even said that this is the John 3.16 of the book of Romans. You remember back in chapter 3, Paul had initially talked about Christ's death and what it accomplished for us, saying that Jesus died and we were redeemed and our sins were propitiated or our sins were covered by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Here in this passage, though, Paul gives us a glimpse as to the motivation behind Jesus' death. Why did God send his son? Why did Jesus die 
for us. The first thing we see in this passage, and, and you can find the outline in our church app this morning, but the first thing we see is this, God loves you. Let me say that again. God loves you. Paul begins this section with a description of the people God loves. Now, you and I would naturally think that because God is holy and because God is perfect and because God is righteous, that his love would be extended to people who are at least remotely similar to him. But actually, the opposite is true. God is drawn to imperfect people. He loves imperfect people people. One, one writer said this, that, that Jesus is drawn to sinners the same way that, that metal shavings are drawn to a magnet. In spite of our condition, God loves us. There are four revealing words in these verses that graphically describe our depraved condition. First thing that Paul shows us is this, that God loved you when you were weak. He, he actually says that in the first verse. We saw that in verse six, while we were still weak. The word weak there has the idea of being helpless, powerless, unable to do anything for yourself. Last week, we introduced our daughter, Amber. Many of you know her. Amber is 26 years old. She has cerebral palsy, and Amber perfectly illustrates this truth. Amber is 100% dependent upon others. She cannot do anything for herself. She can't feed herself. She can't bathe herself. She can't get herself out of bed. Amber can't even tell you what's bothering her. She cannot roll over. She can't even switch positions. She is completely and totally dependent upon others. Now, now that tragic condition perfectly describes our spiritual status. Just as Amber is 100% physically dependent, you and I are 100% spiritually dependent. That's what this word weak means. It means that we can do nothing without Jesus. Here's what that means, is that you and I are oblivious to our sins. Yes, we have a conscience, but apart from Scripture and apart from God, we are generally oblivious to the sins that we commit. We cannot change ourselves. We cannot understand the gospel on our own. Why, why we can't even make the first move to God. <laughs> Listen, the Bible says that no man comes to Jesus unless he is drawn by the Father. We are weak. We are utterly helpless. There's nothing we can do. Paul describes that even further in Ephesians chapter 2 where he uses that phrase. He says, and you were dead in your trespasses and in your sins. A, a spiritually dead person cannot do anything to revive himself or herself. They're dead, they can't make the first move, they can't understand, they can't change, they're dead. That's what Paul says about us spiritually, we're weak. And yet God loves us in spite of our spiritual helplessness. He says a second thing in the passage, he says that he loved us when, or he loved you when you were ungodly. The word ungodly that's used here in, in verse six ties all the way back to what we saw in the beginning of our study in Romans chapter one and verse 18, when Paul said, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Now, you and I would naturally think that the word ungodly means to be unlike God or God is this way and we are a different way. And I think the word uh, makes some reference to that, but it means much more than that. The word ungodly refers to our natural tendency to oppose God to rebel against him, to rebel against his sovereignty, and to rebel against his authority in our lives. Yet in spite of our ungodliness, he loves us. The third thing that Paul says is that he loved you when you were 
a sinner. Uh, that, that's in Romans 5, 8, but God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. The term sinner refers to those who have fallen short of God's holy standard. We saw that in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, one author said that ungodliness describes our incorrect response to God. What some would refer to as the first part of the Ten Commandments, our relationship with God. And the word sinners responds to our incorrect response to others, the, the second half of the Ten Commandments. In other words, we, we respond incorrectly to both God and others. We are ungodly and we are sinners. And in spite of that, God loves us. Uh, Paul uses a, a fourth word. It's found all the way down in verse 10. We actually haven't read it yet, but he uses the word enemy. He says, while we were enemies. And here's what Paul is saying, that, that God loved you and me when we were his enemies. Now, now that word, quite frankly, is a really, really strong word. It not only affirms, as the word ungodly did, that we oppose God. It not only affirms that we are unable to save ourselves, that we violate his holy standard, but it actually indicates that man would attack God. The man would actually oppose and attack God and destroy him if he could. Just as any enemy is seeking to destroy his or her opponent. Some would say that the word even refers back to the fall of Lucifer who opposed God and tried to set himself above God and became God's enemy. Paul says that even when we were his enemies, opposing him and seeking his downfall, he loved us. And I read all those words and I, and I sit back and think, whoa, unbelievable. Not only does that give a solid indictment of our depravity, and we are, we are completely depraved. The word that the reformers use to describe our condition, we're completely depraved. And, and these four words not only give a, a, a complete description of our total downfall and rebellion against God, but that's not the point that Paul is making here in Romans 5. He already made that point in the first part of this epistle. The point that Paul is making here is that in spite of our depravity, God still loves us. And he shows the magnitude of God's love for us. And today, here's what I want you to get. God loves you. And I know for many of us, that's the truth that we learned when we were kids. As little kids growing up in church, if you grew up in church, you learned that song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. We well, hear the Bible, God's word is telling you and I that God loves us. The Paul gives us a second simple yet profound truth in this passage. He not only tells us that God loves us, but he tells us that Christ died for us. In your outline, I personalized that Christ died for you. And notice that that phrase is found two times in our text. Notice verse six once again. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse eight, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. <laughs> Those two verses show us two profound things. Think with me today. The first is this, Christ died at the right time. Verse six once again says, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. What does that mean? I think it means that he died at the right time historically. I would submit to you that Jesus' death was not a random event that happened to occur at a certain time in history. No, to the contrary. The timing of Jesus' death was providential. The timing of Jesus' death was sovereign. It was completely controlled by God. Jesus was born, lived, and died exactly when God planned it. 
Paul in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 says it this way. He says, but when the fullness of time had come. In other words, at the appointed time, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. Jesus died at the right time historically. But I think that Paul's even making maybe a more personal and profound point here. Because I think he's saying that not only did Jesus die at the right time historically, but that Jesus died at the right time personally. By that I mean that, that, that Jesus comes into your life and my life when we need him the most. Notice back once again in verse 6, Paul says, While we were still helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. So, so, so right when we were helpless at our moment of weakness, Christ died for us. As a pastor, one of the things that I love is, is I love hearing your come to Jesus stories. How, how you understood the truth of the gospel and how you embraced the reality of Jesus's life, his, his death on the cross and, and his ultimate resurrection and, and hearing your testimony of how you gave your faith to Christ and you put your faith and your trust in him that many times at your moment of greatest need Jesus entered in to your life that's what Paul says Christ died at the right time but he says the second thing he says that Christ died in the right way here's what I mean by that 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 his response Jesus's response to fallen man was so much different than ours, so much different than mine would have been. His response was so much more magnanimous, so much more charitable, so much more forgiving than mine or yours could have ever been. Paul actually explains it so much better than I could. Notice verse seven, Paul says, for one would scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would even dare to die. The contemporary English version says it in a way that maybe is easier to understand. It says, no one is really willing to die for an honest person, though someone might be willing to die for a truly good person. (laughs) Here's what Paul is saying, that we would be really choosy for whom we would die. We, We probably would do interviews. We probably would do reference checks. After all, who wants to sacrifice for someone who doesn't deserve it, let alone for someone who won't appreciate it? But that's exactly what Jesus did. He died for us not when we deserved it, not when we would appreciate it. He died for us when we were sinners, rebellious, and completely opposed to him. So let me pause for a second and say this. If you're watching our service today or you're listening to the message today and you have never experienced a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, maybe you've attended church before, maybe you'd even consider yourself to be a religious person, but you've never had a a life-changing, a transformational encounter with Jesus Christ, let me share with you today that God loves you. It doesn't matter what you do what you've done. It doesn't matter what your past looks like. It doesn't even matter what situation you are in right now. God loves you. And not only does he love you, but Jesus died for you. And what God desires is that he he longs to draw you to himself, to forgive you of your sin and develop a life-changing relationship with you. So if you're watching today and you would say, man, Brian, that's me, I'd encourage you right in the privacy of of your own home and you can bow your head and your heart and in your own words, pray and confess your sin and state your belief and trust in Jesus Christ and ask him to come into your life and to make a profound difference. And I promise you, if you do that, if you pray that, if you sincerely reach out to him, he will transform your life. Many of us who are watching today have 
already experienced that. We already have a profound relationship with Jesus Christ. So what does this passage do for us? We certainly certainly shouldn't, you know, yawn through it and say, yes, I already know that. To the contrary, this passage should compel us to be grateful. When was the last time that you thank God for his profound love for you? That you thank Jesus for his sacrifice that he made for you? Maybe you want to pause right now and in your own words, just thank God. Thank you, Father, for loving me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. You see, here's what Paul says. God loves you. Christ died for you. But wait, there is so much more. If we ended the message, if the story ended right there, it would be completely profound and absolutely unbelievable. But there is so much more. God not only gives us his love and provides the payment of our sin through Jesus, but he gives us so much more. Notice we see that in the passage. Continue reading in verse 9 with me. Notice what Paul says. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled by the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Much more than that. We also rejoice in God through Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. So what does that much more entail? What does that mean for us? Let me mention four really cool additional benefits that Paul lays out, four more benefits of our justification and, and our salvation experience. The first thing is this, and we've already alluded to it. He says, you are rescued. We saw that in verse nine. He says that we are saved from the wrath of God. Here's what that means, and, and catch this, because we all have a tendency to doubt our salvation sometimes, but here's what that means. You do not ever, 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 did I say ever? You don't ever have to worry about being punished for your sins. You have been rescued completely from God's wrath. Next summer, we're gonna look at the second part of the book of Romans, and we're gonna study Romans chapter eight. And in the first verse of Romans chapter eight, Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation, none whatsoever. Why is that? You and I have been rescued from the wrath to come. Paul says there's a second much more benefit, and it's this. You have been reconciled. As we read through verses 9 through 11, you might have seen the word reconciled is found three times in those verses. The word reconciled speaks of the restoration of a relationship. A married couple may separate for a period of time, but then they will reconcile and come back together. Maybe you've been estranged from a friend for a month or a few years, but then thankfully the two of you reconciled and your relationship was restored. As Dolphin fans, we experience that because we get halfway into the season most years and, and we're so frustrated, we're almost throwing in the towel saying, I'm done, I'm not gonna root for the Dolphins ever again. But then the new season comes with all of the hype and all the new players and we are reconciled to them and we cheer for them again and we hope that this is the year and that this year will be different. Here's what Paul is saying. Because of God's love for you and because of Jesus's death, your relationship with God has been fully restored. You're not an outsider. You're now an insider. You're not a guest seated at the table. You are now a full-fledged family member. You're not an imposter, but you're now an heir of all that God possesses. 
Man, I can't help. That reminds me of the song. And you know the song makes me want to sing out. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this side. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I might have messed that up a little bit, but you get it. You're a part of his family. And catch this, God's desire is to restore you to the relationship that he had with Adam and Eve before the fall. And so because of Jesus, you have been reconciled to God. There's a third truth. Let me give it to you. You are realized. Let me show you what I mean by that. Verse 10, once again, Paul says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Jesus' life here refers to his post-resurrection life. We could speak about his pre-resurrection life, his sinless life that he lived for us before his death. That, 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 that enables us to be saved through all of that. But that's not what Paul is speaking about here. Paul is speaking about his post-resurrection life. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead, ascended up into heaven, and now sits at the right hand of God, making intercession. He intercedes on our behalf to God the Father. Catch this verse, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost. He's able to completely save those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. You see, Jesus' sinless life, death, and resurrection guarantee your justification. But it is Jesus' post-resurrection life and ministry that guarantees your sanctification. And here's what I want you to catch today. Jesus is presently at work. In this moment, he is presently at work, helping you to fully realize and become everything God desires for you to be. That's what Paul meant in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, where Paul says, I am confident, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I get it. There's probably days that you feel more spiritual than others. There's days that you're kind of on fire with your relationship with the Lord and you feel so close. And there's other days that he feels so far away from you. There's days where I'm sure you feel like he's at work in your life and you feel yourself growing spiritually and other days where you wonder if he's close and you don't sense his presence. And you might sit back and wonder, is God really at work in my life? And I can assure you that he is because the life of Jesus today, the post-resurrection life and ministry of Jesus is to assure that what God began in your life will be completed at the second coming of Jesus Christ. You are realized. There's a fourth truth. He says, lastly, that you are able to rejoice. Verse 11, more than that, though, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received reconciliation. Quite frankly, there are two reasons why we rejoice and why we worship together as Jonas is going to come in just a few moments and we're going to end the service rejoicing and worshiping. Why do we rejoice? Why do we rejoice? What do we have to worship? Well, first of all, we rejoice and we worship for who Jesus is. Um, and we just pause in his presence and we recognize his person and we, we realize that he is the only one that is worthy of our worship and we rejoice in who Jesus is. But secondly, we rejoice in what Jesus has done for us. Uh, the fact that, that, that God is for us. And in Romans chapter 8, Paul says, If God is for us, who can be against us? 
What does that mean? It means that today God offers you a complete salvation experience from start to finish. He is finishing in your life what he started. He is so worthy of our worship. Let's worship him together. Why is that? Because he not only gave us an escape from hell, which so often we, we, we assume with our salvation, but he has done so much more. He will bring to fruition everything that he has started in our life and we rejoice and worship him. Let's worship him together. Father, thank you so much for the truth of this word. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to understand it, to fully grasp it. I pray for the person today who maybe has never had that transformational encounter with Jesus, that today they would open up their heart and life and, and give their life to Jesus and you would change their life. And God, I pray for those of us who have already begun that journey. Lord, I pray that you'd help us by faith to realize that you are molding us and shaping us and creating in us the person whom you desire for us to be. And help us to surrender ourselves to you on a regular basis. So today we rejoice and we worship you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Show me what it means to be loved. Come on and sing. Oh.